everybody. Welcome to our 105th week. But who's counting? I am, <laughs> because why not? <laughs> so you guys know what, the, what to do. Uh, hit us up with the Q&A. Four questions. You can harass us in the chat. And you don't even need permission to do that because you guys do it anyway. So, and that's okay. We welcome it. Um, we've got some interesting things to talk about today. A couple polls. We'll have some grab bag questions from our top 110 list that we haven't asked. Uh, that will be, you know, we'll see if we can stump any chumps here. And I think it'll be fun. So, as you guys are ramping on, uh, let's see. I've got to call on Jack first because, you know, I just feel bad for him, you know, and I'm not even a, a Jayhawk fan. You know, I went to Kansas State, but it was a great game. But Jack, give us your monologue and try not to cry. Okay. I've, I've done, I think I've done all my crying that I need to. And actually, I'm very proud of my boys. That's why I have this background still on. And it was a, it was a great game. I think that, you know, it was ours to lose and theirs to win. They came out on fire. I mean, you can analyze different things and you can say, well, you know, Baycock, Baycock rolled his leg or his ankle and things like that. But I mean, they were just, it's like, okay, they were turning left and right. And either way, they're getting, you know, right up against the basket and, you know, getting the two points. And then and if we're not shooting three pointers well, um, then that's just what's going to happen. But I mean, it was, is a great, not bad for an eight seed, you know, so, uh, which we were underrated anyway, in my humble opinion but so um but yeah i'm i'm good but so this the background is just to pay homage to my boys but not for any pity or anything else like that good so i'm good yes i like that coach man i mean you could tell he loves his team and they love him which is like that was the lowest stress game I've ever watched because I actually was rooting for both of them. <laughs> I live in North Carolina and I love North Carolina way more than Kansas, but you know, Kansas is my home state. So anyway. Yeah. I had the privilege of seeing him play. We're, we're two years apart. And um, so, and then that when he did the um, live action at halftime, the scream, I just, I sent that to everyone. <laughs> I was like, I was fired up, you know, even uh, regardless of which side you're on after hearing that you had to be fired up. So it's all good. Yeah, that, that was a fun. So many of those national championships are kind of snoozers. You know, they, they, they build them up. But this one was unbelievable. I thought, oh, my gosh, this is embarrassing. After the first half, I'm like, let's let's turn on one of your Hallmark flicks, honey. <laughs> so. <laughs> all right. Well, Adam. I know you've probably got some thoughts, especially about some of the things that I've been seeing in the headlines about Biden's proposed tax bill taking us uh, the top marginal rate, uh, rate to the highest in the world and all kinds of stuff. So um, I'm sure you've got some thoughts. Yeah, I mean, you know, again, it's all doom and gloom, right? <laughs> so just a just a refresher on, on the um, proposed tax law changes. If anybody really is a true, you know, policy wonk, you know, you can Google uh, Green Book Treasury 2023 and read all about it, you know, but, <laughs> um, you know, it's just, a, it's just a reminder that, you know, the capital gains tax, you know, in terms of impacting our client base, you know, the capital gains tax proposed increase, you know, is, is, probably number one on everybody's mind, you know, that's going to be, you know, on incomes over a million bucks, married filing jointly 500, if you're single, you know, that would phase in and, and be at the top capital gains would be at the top marginal, right? Presumably on every dollar past, you know, the, the, the phase in amount, you know, the, the, the places where we've gotten questions the most would be on people selling their businesses with an installment sale. And in that scenario, you know, you just want to save yourself the flexibility that if the if the if the payment is going to be, you know, one million one hundred dollars if you amortize it over five years, you know, maybe you just consider extending the amortization period or or front loading it a little bit more, so you got a little flexibility on the backside. Um, yeah, that's probably number one. Probably number two biggest impact, which just you know keeps on. You've got some clients that are actually doing something about it, but, um, you know, that 
really needs to be given some consideration, especially with this potential um, tax law change is uh, 2026, you know, estate tax exemption goes back down unless some change happens. Also as part of this proposal, um, they want to tax unrealized gains on transfers. You know, that's, you know, one can make an argument that really, you know, that was a double benefit to people, you know, get, getting a step up in basis plus an exemption amount. You know, you can make that argument all day long, but the point is this would create a bunch of tax revenue where there was none before on um, it, uh, before, you know, that, that you used to get a pass on. So, um, you know, it, but you'd have 15 years to pay it, but it, it just put, it means that people really need to get on the ball in terms of, um, getting their estates uh, buttoned up uh, and in order um, in order just to mitigate, you know, any of this potentially. And then, you know, the, the top marginal rate, you know, going up by a couple percentage points is another thing that just, you know, be aware of, you know, it's coming around, <laughs> you know, potentially like it's, it, that's due to happen anyway, again, in 2026. So all this really does is just accelerate into 2023. According to the proposal, still would have to pass Congress, you know, some of the stuff that was already going to happen in, 2026. So that's uh that's that's what I got on that. I think the second biggest thing, yeah, you know, we've kind of seen this week is we're doing um individual tax returns and tax extensions for people. Is that you know, despite um us saying over and over again that the ERTC money that you receive back, which is great, <laughs> um, that you got it. The, the employer retention tax credit, it's taxable income. So just, you know, remember that, <laughs> you know, as a thing. So a lot of people are like, wait a minute, I have to pay taxes on income that I haven't received yet. I don't even know if I'm going to get it back from the IRS yet. So that's, um, that's just, you know, that's just something to consider, you know, out there. Just remember that. That's some good stuff. <clears throat> Um, for those who have come on here in the last couple minutes, uh, we are going to launch a couple polls. One is just for fun and frivolity. I'll save that for later on. <laughs> um, but we do have some interesting topics that I want to talk about because there's um, a thing that we just ran into recently, and I know we run into it pretty frequently, but this one was a big deal for a client that I think you guys would want to know about. And then um, we will pull out of the grab bag some of our questions. So if you guys have any questions in the meantime, hit us up and we'll get to those right away. So uh, Jack, I know we talked about the, the Tar Heels on the front end. I have a feeling you probably have some um, more substantive, not more meaningful, but more substantive <laughs> conversations or topics that you want to call talk about Any, yeah. anything yeah so one thing that comes to mind um is that uh yesterday well there's this package out there and it's uh, 55 billion in relief to restaurants and other small businesses hit hard by the pandemic now the thing is when they say other small businesses i think what they mean is related hospitality type businesses so you have issues where it's like, well, why do they get more money and the rest of us um, don't? Uh, there's also, and, and so there's arguments on both sides that, you know, hospitality industry is pretty big industry and kind of makes a lot of things, well, you know, the world go around in certain uh, aspects. But um, so there was a, a little bit of a, a wrench that was thrown in that maybe was resolved, which is that uh, some of the abuses, it's related to still, I think, uh, wage related employee related and so with all the abuses that occurred with the reimbursement of that uh, with PPP and other they're, they're trying to put in mechanisms to um, avoid that or to prevent that and there's a significant penalty that was inserted with respect to um, they call it wage theft uh, so there's an official term for it now and so that got put in late last night. So it's still in the house, uh, has a long way to go. 
but that is, you know, I, I get questions all the time. What else is coming? Is there another stimulus check coming? No, there's not likely not going to happen. Uh, generally speaking, um, you know, what about other potential credits that are coming? So, um, you know, I haven't heard anything really significant or substantive other than this potentially coming down the road. Um, we're kind of, I think, at a, a wait and see as the economy, uh, despite inflation, continues to rev back up and people are out there out and about without masks on and, and doing all the things and trying to get back to the norm, which I think from, from all many perspectives is the new norm. It is, you know, all the things that we've talked about in the past as far as remote work and liabilities for that and, uh, you know, costs associated with that. It, I, I wouldn't be surprised if there is, um, you know, provisions in uh, the tax code or regulations that deal with expenses uh, related to office equipment necessarily. And then it's like, okay, what happens when you uh, authorize uh, an employee to use their personal computers? Is that now a business asset, uh, you know, that can be deducted, you know, did you somehow, even though it's, it, I own this computer, if I'm using my personal computer for work stuff, is that now sort of an asset of the company? And so, you know, obviously there's a tax answer to that and there's a legal answer to that, um, which I don't know uh, that currently, but I wouldn't be surprised if those kind of things, um, evolution of the tax code continue to occur because of the shift that we have had to do currently and, and we'll have to continue to do. I mean, we have people in our office that um, have enjoyed working from home and, um, you know, as far as the attorneys go, it's always been kind of an option. I feel like there needs to be a, a good balance of that because, you know, I have a responsibility to mentor some of the younger people. I benefit from the, the older guys uh, that are in the office that I can go and talk to and, at, you know, hey, what do you think about this? I mean, as you guys know, I have the guy who re rewrote the LLC, North Carolina LLC Act is two offices down from me. And I can go ask him a question and save myself a long time of research. Now, he actually makes the associates come into the discussion with an answer or three possibilities. Um, I'm glad that I graduated out of that because I can just basically say, what is the answer kind of thing without it being very professorial. So um, anyway, uh, so that's a little bit of an update on that. All right, cool. I'm going to go ahead and launch this poll on net operating losses. And then we'll get into an example. And then I want Adam to be, go a little bit deeper on this. But um, so I'm going to launch this poll. If you would, if you can see it and you're on a computer, here are the three options to this question. How familiar are you with strategies for handling net operating losses? One, I could teach the tax ins and outs out of it right now. Give me the mic. <laughs> so... Uh, I know about the concept, but I don't, don't know how to deal with it. And I was told that a loss is a loss. Nothing I can do about it. Keep voting, please. Let's see what people say. I, I, was, I was hoping we'd get somebody that, you know, could teach the ins and outs of it. And then we could do kind of a cage fight, fight you know, <laughs> a battle of the minds, you know. Um, and, and a reminder, the voting is anonymous, right? I mean, I don't think- It, it is anonymous and, yeah. and nobody's gonna be made feel, to feel stupid here. Because, he, so while you guys are finishing up on the vote, so it's pretty clear. <laughs> yeah, interesting. So I know the concept, but don't know how to deal with it. Um, that is likely. I'm surprised that there weren't more in the I was told the loss is a loss because here's the scenario. This just happened a week ago. Without naming names, there's a, a company that is a mutual client of both Jack's and ours. And uh, this company, the last two years have been really hard on them because of the industry that they're in. Um, and their CPA had told them, hey, you know, nothing you can do about it. Loss is a loss. So those who voted in that last tier, you're not alone because uh, their CPA said that. Well, that's not true um, because we went back five years when they were in the highest 
marginal tax bracket. And we could, for 2020, we could go back and take those losses back to 2015, which meant to them, it was about a hundred grand in cash that's coming back to them, a hundred thousand bucks. And that's no, that's not small chump change and they're not a huge company. So um, I'm gonna share results so you guys can see this right now. Um, but I thought, man, if, if CPAs are, are telling the client, a loss is a loss, nothing you can do about it when that's not true, then you guys probably wouldn't know the ins and outs of that too. So Adam, I'm gonna to toss the mic over to you and have you expand a little bit more on that and, and talk about what we look for and what, what the code actually addresses. Yeah, Gary stole all my thunder there. <laughs> oh, sorry. So, yeah, well, you just explained it now. Um, you know, this was a this was a provision of the CARES Act that didn't get a lot of press around it um, because it wasn't immediate stimulus money that you could apply for and put in your pocket. But you know, basically, what they did with the CARES Act, um, and this will get a little bit confusing, but you know. Used to be back in the good old days before the uh, Trump um, tax change, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Uh, if you lost money, um, you know, A, that sucked. But what made it suck less <laughs> is that you could carry it back to a year that you paid taxes, apply the loss, and get a refund. So for a lot of clients, you know, it, it, it was a way to at least make, you know, the lemon a little bit less bitter. I'm not saying that it was lemonade because you still lost the money, but it made the lemon a little bit less bitter because, you know, wrapped up the year, it's crappy, I'm digging my way out of the hole, I don't have any cash, what am I going to do? You know, well, we can take this, um, this loss, carry it back to a previous year and get your money back, like Gary said, 100 grand. Well, you know, there were a lot of good things in the um, Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, but one of the one of the things they did away with was um, the loss, the ability to carry a loss backwards. Um, you could only carry it forwards into a future year. So for most of our clients, you know, since that point, you know, we just said, well, you got a loss, we carry it forward into a future year when you have money. So while that is while that saves you tax money because you just, you know, next year you make money, loss. Uh, sort of like capital gain loss carry for is loss wipes out some of your current year income. You don't have to pay taxes. You know, you at least got a pass on it. You weren't, you didn't have the ability to get an immediate shot in the arm and get some cash in your pocket. Well, part of the CARES Act, and it's, it's just starting to show up now, you know, for, for people, um, because this is the, you know, first time we're kind of seeing the data is that if you had a loss, then instead of having to carry it forward, you can carry it backwards, which is what we did in this client's case. So with a really interesting um, scenario, you know, if you had a loss in 2020 or you had a loss in 2019, it doesn't even have to be 2021. You can go back five years preceding that, which is what we did in this client's case. So it kind of opens up a wealth of opportunities for you if you had a loss in a year other i mean in 2021 you can go backwards too but it, if you had a loss in a preceding tax year and you're like god i could really use some cash i don't want to carry the loss forward you have the opportunity to potentially go backwards if, if, if the benefit to going backwards in terms of a immediate shot in the arm and cash and b you know it's at a higher effect ta tax rate will put some money in your pocket so you know in this particular instance you know, they went back to pre-tax cuts and jobs act um, time. So that loss actually had more valuable value because Gary pointed out the tax rate was higher back then. I know that's a little bit wonky, but you know, it, it, was, it was a feature of the CARES Act that didn't get a lot of publication, but um, yeah, there you go. Yeah, great job. So I figured this would, you know, prompt a question and Robert Mayetta, you did not disappoint. Uh, so great question here. Does the carry back of the loss open the tax year for an audit? Um, 
you know, someone might examine the claim. I've never, I've never actually had the tax year opened up for audit. Um, but, you know, and so presumably the statute of limitations would not apply because what you're not, you're not actually amending that tax return. You're just doing a carryback claim. So the, the return was still filed when it was filed. So the answer to that is without definitively saying I'm 99.999% sure it would not affect the year that you're taking the carryback claim backwards to. Yeah, you know, but we have we have had questions on, you know, how did you calculate this amount on a carryback claim before? Because it's not, you know, it's not the easiest form to fill out because you got to account for, you know, different additions and preferences that are different based on a loss carryback. You know, so it's it's not easy to do. Good question. Good answer. All right. Any other questions about NOLs? If you do. Hit us up. So the next question is is going to be vague, but there's a there's a method to this, and the reason is I want to know. So the question is, what's keeping you up at night? <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and launch it now. Um, and I'm not talking about you know bad pizza <laughs> or or scary movies. <laughs> um, I'm really interested on in the pulse of what you as business leaders what's because there are a lot of like wild cards that have been thrown our way in the last two years but now it's even more in the last year um so current business concerns keeping you up at night inflation retaining and finding talent supply chain issues sales growth or covid so if you would Keep voting, and that, then we'll close it in about 15 seconds. All right. Last call. This is interesting. All right. I'm going to share the results with you all. <clears throat> I'm surprised. Um, surprised a little bit that inflation isn't more. Um, it depends, I guess, on the industry. You know, if you're heavy in transportation <clears throat> or you've got a lot of heavy equipment running diesel fuel at almost five bucks a gallon, uh, those that are clients that are in those industries, they're talking about it, but the retaining and finding talent, that, that makes sense. Seeing a lot of that too. Hey, I'm not, I'm not surprised to see that, um, that the talent is because I'm looking at the thing, you know, and kind of seeing it phrased this way. I mean, look at the things that are more in our control, uh, versus out of our control. Some people are like, okay, inflation. Well, I, you know, I can't do anything about that. It is what it is. And I'm just going to have to roll yeah. with it. Supply chain, you know, you're not, you can't go out and drive a boat from one side of the ocean to the other. So, um, sales growth. I mean, that is, yeah, in your control, but that is a mechanism of other people's actions and reactions to what the goods and services that you're selling. Um, so I think that the talent issue, uh, we were just talking about that this morning um, in an internal meeting um, <clears throat> across our various offices. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's, it's tough. Um, not only finding, but the retaining. I mean, it's just a constant, very competitive market for talent. And um, in some cases, it's very cutthroat, meaning there's high bounties and high expectations and high demands to keep those people on board, um, including, and I, may, I know I mentioned this previously in a previous um, discussion, that uh, going through an interview process and then at literally right before you say, okay, you know, we feel good, uh, you know, get an offer letter to you. It's like, oh, um, yeah, one other thing. Uh, I'd like to work remote three days a week. And you're like, okay. And, and you know, in some case, and earlier on, it was like, um, no, this is about, um, you know, collaboration. And even though you can, you know, we have a certain, we want to maintain a certain culture, but 
you know, there have been some instances where we said, okay, for now, we will, we, we will consider doing that. But really, our culture is about collaboration. And it's just, um, I wouldn't say easier, because I mean, we can, it's easier actually to get on the video rather than me driving from South Charlotte to uptown uh, twice a day and you know, reversing that. So um, you know, that, that really, again, not surprising that that's where that ended up and that's on people's minds. I've got a quick yeah. story. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead, Adam. Oh, I was just going to say, you know, the, I mean, in terms of the, you're, you know, no answer to this, but you're not alone um, out there. You know, our, I don't know what your experience has been, Jack, but our retention rate of pandemic hires, I mean, we, we used to be, unbelievable at retention it's like look i would have i would have put our culture as a competitive advantage because you know a lot of other cpa firms lose people have a bunch of turnover we had like literally almost none but if you isolate that down to pandemic hires <laughs> i mean we're doing like we're, we're 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 retaining maybe at best 60 to 70 percent maybe <laughs> um because they never you know they never got a chance to get assimilated. And, and I, I got to say, I mean, look, not to not to be a jerk, but while I'm judging other people, you know, when you when when you look at like other companies that have virtual cultures or always have been remote working, it's like, oh, yeah, it's not. I mean, they've always been remote working. So their culture always was a remote work culture. Um, mm -hmm. So I think it's a little bit easier. But at the same time. I would be curious to see. So in other words, the people opted into that because they wanted a remote working environment. And then the, you know, the, the management team and the ownership team wanted a remote working environment. You know, that's, they set out to build a company that was a remote um, company by default rather than being uh, thrust upon it. But even with those people, I still would be kind of curious to know what's their, what's their retention rate of pandemic hires because because now you've got a bunch of people that want to work from home and have been working from home but didn't necessarily weren't necessarily built to thrive in the working from home environment so i i just i am kind of curious like if anybody's got any sort of data on yeah i was a remote company but if i look at my pandemic hires versus my pre-pandemic hires, I still see, you know, a difference either in productivity, retention, just cultural integration, you know, whatever, you know, whatever data point you use. I'm just saying that from our perspective, you know, we haven't really had many clients yet that have said, oh, people, not an issue, plenty of people to go around, <laughs> one. And number, you know, number two, it's like the pandemic hires has just been tough for everybody in terms of keeping them. So, anywho. so great point. If you would hit us in the chat and, and hit us up with these things. One, have you seen a higher attrition rate in your pandemic hires than pre pandemic hires? One. And two, what are you doing personally or your company? What's your company doing to help address that issue that seems to be working. I'd be really curious to see that. Um, Jack, you said you, you're talking about, you know, the, the last minute, oh, by the way, I want to do this all remote. Um, real life example and, and, and that foot logo, which needs a shoe on it, I think, but that foot logo uh, reminded me because my son is a shoe designer <clears throat> and worked for Reebok when he was, um, in college as a designer on an internship, then went, I mean, uh, at Puma first and then got hired by Reebok. Well, he's, he's freelancing for Puma now. They would like to hire him because they've had a whole mass exodus of designers in Boston, but my son doesn't want to move back to Boston. And so he said, well, would you let me even work? <clears throat> um, you know, I could, if I, if I flew there from Denver, for a couple days a week, two or three days a week, and, and then be off. Would you guys do that? No. Well, interesting, you know, that a, a great brand like Puma is still being inflexible. Um, 
I don't know. I th- it, it, it begs the question of flexibility and, you know, what are you going to do? Because if the tea leaves are saying talent's leaving and we're not paying attention, but we're going to be rigid about it. It's interesting. <clears throat> um, oh, interesting. Um, one of the comments is retention, question mark. We can't even get candidates to call in for a phone interview. Whew, that's rough. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, that, that, that's about right. I mean, it's like we, even in our own case, it's like for the first time ever, we had candidates renege, not more than, you know, more than once, you know, Hey, yeah, no, love it. Ready to start, ready to go. You know, really looking yeah. forward to uh, working with you. Nope. Got a different offer. Sorry. I already took it. <laughs> it's like, yeah. <laughs> unheard of. <laughs> Yeah, interesting. One thing while we're on that conversation, look up a, a thing called HIRECT, H I R E C T. Um, it's a chat based uh, hiring thing that is, it's an interesting thing. Um, we've had a lot of people hit us up for positions, but they wanted to be remote and they were in New York City or wherever. Um, and we're like, nah, we want it in. North Carolina. We want to end Charlotte. But that's an interesting thing that I've been playing around with for the last few months, and it's free. Um, nothing in it for me, but just check that out. High wrecked. Um, good question here from Brian. Uh, inflation to a degree is driven by supply chain issues. I'm about to enter into a, an area development agreement in the franchise industry. All right, so pay attention to this one, Jack don't want to turn the franchiser off with a multitude of nits and nats, but what four items should a developer address? Like I'm being tested and and to write a a law school essay. So I think generally speaking is, is to what I would say box in the variables. And so in dealing with, to the extent you can. So you know, in in an area development agreement, there is a cadence, a time frame for opening the first one, the second one, the third one, the fourth one, which makes certain presumptions that let's say it's on an annual basis that within 12 months, every 12 month period, everything is going to go as planned, meaning that if you're building something that there's going to be um, people to build it, supplies to, to acquire, that you're not going to have any permitting issues or the fire marshal can't show up for three or four weeks kind of thing. So those kind of things. Um, and, and so being able to maybe negotiate flexibility in that development schedule moving forward. Um, the other thing, and this is generally speaking, regardless of necessarily inflation or supply chain, is negotiating the the financial variables necessarily and i uh, from my perspective and experience those franchisees or multi-unit developers have more negotiating power when they are on the frontier of a geography of a region of a territory um, versus being very fungible which is well if not you then someone else can come in and do this very easily and so um i i help my franchisee prospect clients negotiate through that and try to get some concessions and whether it is short term or long term meaning the entire term of the franchise agreement which may be five ten five or ten years is maybe in the first year and in the argument or the or the the justification is um wouldn't you franchise or prefer to allow us to use some of the revenue to reinvest in us, which then brings a higher royalty. So it's a lot longer term play. So you have those kind of considerations. And then, you know, one thing in a franchise relationship is that you have what are called approved suppliers. And a lot of times the franchisor is an approved supplier, sometimes the only approved supplier. And so to the extent that you can put the onerous of a supply chain issue back on them and say, yes, well, you know, if there's a supply chain issue, then, and and you're the only source, then who should bear that assumption of risk? Should it be us? And for example, in a minimum royalty scenario that we still have to pay a minimum royalty if we can't get the supplies, but you're the one only, you're the only one supplying us. So 
various negotiating points that um, uh, both are from pre-COVID times, but then also during COVID that gives you a little bit of, of negotiating power. And we've talked about this before, which is the force majeure clause. And there's been discussion on both sides of it, whether or not at this point, COVID um, epidemic pandemic is a force majeure situation. Typically force majeure is something that is unanticipated, or maybe anticipated, but it doesn't exist necessarily. So something that hypothetically could happen. Well, it's happened. So you have these force majeure provisions. You have, I think there's gonna be a lot of litigation in the coming years with respect to business interruption insurance. So far, the insurance companies are winning that battle, which is business interruption. If you read many of those policies, literally it has, it deals with physical damage, not financial damage. So, um, or that the cause of the financial damage is physical damage and not necessarily um, employment, labor issues, supply chain issues, et cetera. So you have all these things and we've talked about, you know, here we are two years later from the beginning uh, of when we've been doing this. And, and uh, you know, I think that our litigators are just gonna be busy sorting through all this stuff um, as far as um, um, COVID and, and epidemic, pandemic, et cetera. So those are just kind of some key fundamental points in the negotiation process in the franchise arena. All right, so um, I'm going to pick out of the grab bag one of the questions that we haven't asked. <laughs> so put your thinking caps on, guys. <laughs> All right, this is a, a, a jump ball. <clears throat> I just inherited property. How do I determine the value? <laughs> um. How much do you think it's worth? It, yeah. What, what, <laughs> what's what what's the emotional that? value? One million. <laughs> no, no, it's a good. It's a good question. I mean, you know, presumably this is for your stuff up in basis. I think if it's if it's something that's readily discernible, like gold or a stock or whatever, you know, publicly traded stock. I mean, you're just going to use the data data. You know, as your as your valuation. Um, if it's real estate, you know, you could have an appraiser or you could use the property tax value, you know, Zillow, you know, minus what house prices have gone up in value, you know, in, in the time frame between the date of death versus when you got the, the Zillow estimate. I mean, just something that something, something that if I were to audit you would seem like a reasonable, you know, fact, <laughs> uh for me to be able to use so when when basis when basis isn't determinable but there are publicly available sources that can help you kind of estimate what it might have been the irs typically is not a bunch of jackasses <laughs> you know they're only jackasses when it's unprovable <laughs> you know by any means <laughs> you know when it's like look i could take zillow let's agree to you know 85 percent of zillow you know they'll generally be okay with stuff like that so, I, I, you know, you have your kind of go-to typical standard methods of valuation, whether it's income market approach, et cetera. So I think that that is the starting point. The challenge becomes, and, you know, since we were talking about Kansas and K-State, um, so I have family members that are out there that are uh, wheat farmers and they still own the land. They don't farm the land themselves, but they lease it out. And so, you know, the value to my family you know, it is, is maybe variable in a sense that is it the value of the, uh, the land? Is it the value that is generated by the crop production and sale? Uh, is, it, is, uh, do futures impact that? Uh, I, I have learned a lot over the years about sustainability of soil and, and why you plant different things at different times and don't keep planting the same thing year after year after year. Um, maybe that's, you know, farming 101, but, and it makes sense after you hear it and it's like, okay, now I get it. Why, for example, there's down here in Marvin, there's a, a tract of land on Waxhaw Marvin road and they rotate crops. Um, I don't know if they actually, I've, I've always thought about 
well, they seem to harvest it after the harvest point. So I don't know if it's one of those scenarios where they get paid for growing it and not necessarily having to sell it, like the subsidy that they, I don't even know if that still exists, but uh, so, you know, it, you know, what is the value of that land? And, and going back to that land that's around the corner here is, um, okay, as this area continues to develop too, it's like, okay, is it the future value of that corner of real estate for uh, an alternative use? Likely, yes. I mean, you know, if, if you've been around Charlotte and, and South Charlotte or, or familiar with it, you know, watching all of this farmland get gobbled up and then, you know, they're building another Publix or Harris Teeter or both uh, competing on each corner. So, you know, trying to get away from civilization, it keeps finding me, it seems like over the course of the decades, the further south I move. So, um, there the, but I think that the, the typical valuation methods is, is the starting point. I forgot about your um, ties back to Kansas. So, you know, we've got Kansas and Oklahoma kind of wrapped up here between the three of us. <laughs> I drove the combine. I actually <laughs> and we're all the happy to be living in North Carolina. <laughs> I've driven an unsynchronized pickup truck. Um, that's hard. You miss the gear. You either grind it and find it, or you're coming to a complete stop and starting over. So yeah. <laughs> so. I grew up double clutching my grandpa's '49 Ford flathead wheat truck in the fields <laughs> and you had to double clutch that baby. All right. Next question. This is probably for you, Adam. And actually two has to do with life insurance, dividends, and policies. First of all, how are life insurance dividends taxable? And then the second one, how are life insurance policies taxed? Um, so I'll go in I mean, the dividend, I believe is taxable, but I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head, but I believe it, it I mean, typically the income produced from it, you get a K-1 for it or a statement on it. So it's included as, it's included as dividend income. Um, on the life insurance itself, it, you know, really has two components. You know, if you kind of start with the death benefit, and this would apply to both a term policy and a whole life cash surrender value policy, the death benefit is not taxable. It's because I mean that's why you pay for it with post tax money is it's not taxable. So, you know, the thing that you need to cons so a lot, a lot of times people think, ah, I don't have a taxable state and I've got life insurance, everything will be fine. Yeah, it's great. So if I kick it, my wife inherits or my wife gets my life insurance policy. Now she has cash. You know, if she dies, though, if that cash put her in a taxable estate, that's taxable, <laughs> meaning like you're right, you know, to the beneficiary, it's not taxable, but there's a potential that it becomes taxable based on the fact that the person who is a beneficiary dies. So you just want to think about that when you're thinking about, you know, who's going to get your life insurance proceeds. It's a good reason to have your, your kids be the beneficiaries because at least you skip, you know, a generation of that or grandkids be the diff, diff beneficiaries. You skip a couple of generations um, of that. So in terms of the only other taxable events you're going to have on life insurance, the, the cash surrender value, you know, the whole point of a cash surrender value is it's meant to be, you know, an investment vehicle that, that grows at a guaranteed rate of return, you know, based on, you know, some, you know, mathematical formula. So if you, if you cash it out, then your gain is just what it appreciated in value relative to what you paid in improvements, you know, just like you'd have gain on any other stock. So, and, and I have a, it's a related comment to insurance, but really more in the operating agreement or shareholders agreement where you have buy sell provisions and then another a related comment to an operating agreement. So the first is, is that you know, many times an operating agreement or a shareholders agreement will have a provision or if you, know, is, you can call it a buy sell agreement um, has the provision that insurance is purchased or shall be purchased and the insurance proceeds are gonna be used. And then you deal with 
uh, is the company paying for it? And then you have, you know, that's income to the, the person that's being paid for on the behalf and you got to pay tax on that. So I'm not talking about all that stuff, but the, the point is, is that uh, you have the value of this insurance policy is set and it is maybe meant to cover 80% of the obligation of the payout, 80% of the value of the payout. So 80% of the 50% if it's two owners, 50-50. Well, over the course of time, as the business grows, hopefully, the, that coverage, let's say it's, I don't know, $5 million, um, no longer covers 80%. It covers 78%, covers 72%, covers 69%. And, and, and I've seen uh, recently and in, in the past where that gets forgotten. So the, either the increase in coverage or an acknowledgement that it's been decreased. So my suggestion to clients is, is that at the time that you are doing your taxes and you're doing your annual reports, you should also take a look at your insurance policies to make sure that they are functioning as you intend them to be, which is if it's 80% of that payout to that surviving spouse or surviving beneficiary, Make sure it covers 80%. Um, relatedly, and this is happening um, seemingly very often, is that you have an operating agreement that someone pulled off a shelf somewhere. Uh, and maybe it, it was likely drafted by a lawyer at some point, And it's being recycled for a new entity. Um, the original entity was taxed as a partnership. So all of the provisions and references to the IRS, the, the um, Internal Revenue Code, to the Treasury regulations are all from the partnership section of the code. You have an S-Corp election. An operating agreement for an S-Corp looks different than for a partnership, but that seems to get forgotten. And then you have essentially an S-Corporation or an LLC that is elected S Corp status tax treatment, and you have an operating agreement that reads as if it's a partnership, that's going to create problems. I mean, the better scenario is obviously that you've been paying um, and, and filing an 1120S, uh, you know, and doing things on a shareholder level as a corporation, as an S Corp, but you still have these provisions that are inconsistent and in the worst case scenario potentially could blow or may have blown your S Corp election. So I was putting together a, a, a PowerPoint slide. It's about seven or eight entities. And what happened, that's exactly what happened, which is the original entity or original two entities were taxed as a partnership. And then they basically took that operating agreement and just said, oh, we'll just change the name, same owners, or maybe added an owner, subtracted an owner, and uh, good enough. And nope. So just be aware of that, that um, it's easy to do and easy to overlook, but it can create significant problems down the road um, if you don't, if you're not careful. Words matter, <clears throat> excuse me, words matter in this instance, very much so. Good responses. And you know, this is not easy. Uh, when I'm, I'm doing, you know, complete grab bag and they have no idea what I'm pitching. <laughs> so good job. <laughs> I, I, I would be very sweaty about that. Like, oh boy, but I'm the one that gets to throw the pitch. So, all right. Last question. I'm, I'm, I'm disappointed. Nobody's taken us up on the chat though, to give us any ideas of what's working or what's not working um on the retention front but you know i'm going to just take silence as you're as mystified as we are so but if anybody does have any things that are working hit us up in the chat um and we'll share it so kind of the the final <laughs> and i altered this question because i didn't want to start a political uh battle here but um so now that Elon Musk is the largest shareholder of Twitter, will Tesla vehicle sales go up or down? Here's vote <laughs> up, down, who cares? <laughs> oh boy. 
recording. <laughs> ah, right on. <laughs> ah, that's funny. All right. I'm going to share that. Oh, somebody said up. Uh, and I don't, if they continue to go up, it's not going to be because he owns whatever, 9% of Twitter. Is it 6.9 or 9.6? I don't remember. Dyslexia is kicking in, evidently. Oh, that's pretty funny. All right, cool. 9.2. All right, thank you, Robert. <laughs> Uh, okay, so this is how y'all voted. Pretty funny. All right. Any last thoughts from y'all? Oh, we do have a question. Retention issue bonuses paid to current employees provided retention criteria are met. Oh, interesting. Brian, thank you for weighing in on that. I mean, is that, interesting. Is, is that a comment or a question? It, well, it's a comment. It, it came in on questions, but it, this has to do with, you know, the question that we asked, hey, what are you guys doing that seems to be working on retention? And this was bonuses paid to current employees provided retention criteria are met. Yeah, so an interesting phenomenon, though, is like once you put the retention bonus in, and they are going to get that bonus, then what's next? And, you know, I've seen this phenomenon where you have um, a, a exodus. If you don't continue shelling out stuff, then, I mean, so that's why you see some of these larger companies uh, that will issue uh, benefits, uh, stock, <clears throat> either stock or options and in, in three, four year increments. So it's like, okay, you get it, but it doesn't vest for another three years. But once you get a few of those, it's like you get something in March, April of every year. So it keeps you going, keeps you going. And I've seen where <clears throat> in a merger, the surviving company did not continue the merged company's benefit plan, stock issuance, because their plan was just different. And so you saw a lot of those legacy merged employees leave when the legacy benefits or options were, um, were, were no longer existed when they burned through them. So they got their money and then they were like, see ya. So that's, that is a problem with doing that, but you know, it's okay. Is that it's better than nothing. And so at least it, and it does, it does impact people's behavior. And I've seen, well, you know, when in dealing with employing employment issues on behalf of clients and it does cause them pause to say well if i leave uh i'll get paid when i'm supposed to get paid um i may get a partial bonus uh, in some cases it's a complete forfeiture if you are not employed by at the time at the date that you receive that bonus then you don't get the bonus it's a complete forfeiture uh in some cases but um you know, so it, it has caused people to make decisions to stay or go as being, and then that's what the, the purpose of those things are. They're handcuffed. They're trying to handcuff you to your job um, so you don't lose those benefits, so. Uh, interesting. So uh, this is a follow-on from Brian. Golden handcuffs are only more appropriate for highly paid employees. At the lower end, we see peer pressure to stay on usually require six months yeah that's accurate i think it's i think that's it's across good. the board where it it really just depends on the programs as well um you know kind of flipping the switch a little bit this this uh company that i'm talking about also has they call them um uh bravo bravo dollars and it's a way to uh, reward good behavior, but it's, it's a peer speaking of peer pressure, um, but a, a peer to peer reward for good behavior. So for example, um, uh, a legal, let's say a legal assistant were to help out another legal assistant on a big project. So you have maybe a hundred, you know, I'm just throwing numbers out there, a hundred dollars in Bravo dollars that you give, and you can give some of that to another person. Um, 
and then they accumulate that. So maybe every couple of months, it's kind of like uh, um, the way Wheel of Fortune used to be. You know, remember you used to win the money and then you get to use the money to buy stuff and the camera's zooming around. And so that's that's what I kind of think of when I think of this program. But uh, so um, that's just, since we're talking about what may work, I've seen that work as well. And it does, it rewards. I mean, obviously it's the employer who's paying for it, but it creates this camaraderie and sense of, okay, I'm going to help you not to get the reward. That's kind of like just the perk of doing it. Hopefully it causes you to, to want to do it, not for the reward, but for the help. And then you're like, oh, and I also get some money, you know, to buy some, whatever I want. I was going to say buy a Walkman because that came up in a conversation <laughs> yesterday. And then on 80s on 8, or maybe no, it was classic rewind. They, when they play, sometimes when before they play a song, they make that sound where, you know, when you, if you had the play button down and you hit the rewind, it makes that funny noise on the rewind because it's playing the music backwards in like. Oh, hours. right. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. Way off on a tangent there. Sorry. Back masking. That's a whole different, that's a whole different topic. <laughs> oh man really good questions today um so anybody that's still on here and i think we'll we'll make uh an announcement later on but one of the things that i thought was interesting so sales growth is one of those concerns uh, we have just announced that we have acquired jim dunn and at Sandler franchise, uh, uh, Sandler training on with their expertise on sales growth because they've helped us for the last about eight years. And we decided that's a chronic issue that most of our clients deal with. And so we are bringing a more integrated approach to that. So we're pretty excited for all we know, we're the only CPA firm in the country that's done that. <laughs> but, you know, there are plenty of things that we do that nobody else has done and uh, it's edge. not just to be different what's that cutting edge well yeah right but the whole reason is because we we're serious about helping companies save money make money stay out of trouble and have fun and we're really good on the saving money and staying out of trouble and having fun but the um we felt like we could up the game on the helping them make money and so we went with a proven resource. So we're pretty excited about it. So anyway, for those who came on here late, we will put this up on the BGW YouTube channel later on today. So you can watch the front end of this on the rants and raves. And uh, we plan on being back here on the same bat channel next week. And there will be more grab bag questions and more. It sounds like there'll be more some, some more uh current topics to be discussing too, depending on what's happening with Congress and these uh, sales or tax increases and all that kind of stuff. We'll see what happens there. So thank you for taking time. Adam and Jack, brilliant as always and always entertaining. Thank you so much. You guys have a great rest of the day and great rest of the week. Thank you. You too. Thank you guys. All right. See ya.